why don't we go ahead and get started? Uh, so my name is Emily Silent. I'm the development associate here at Potomac Riverkeeper Network. Uh, and today we're gonna be talking about river access. Um, so we have the three of our river keepers with us today. Uh, we have Brent Walls, our Upper Potomac Riverkeeper, Mark Frondorf, our Shenandoah Riverkeeper, and Dean Nyox, our Potomac Riverkeeper. So it's really kind of Harper's Ferry down. You can see the three of them are on the screen. So um, you guys are all muted right now. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to type them in the chat. Um, we're gonna take questions at the end just to uh, keep things going. Um, and yeah. So why don't we go ahead and get started? Brent, if you wanna kick us off. Yep, wait, all right, Emily, wait, wait, we're recording, right? Yes, yes we, we are. are yep, yep. Okay. Yes, just we're to make recording sure. the session too. So um, uh, if you wanna watch it again, or if you have to cut out halfway through, I'll, I'll email everyone out the link to the recording. All righty, very cool. Thank you, Emily. And thank you everyone for joining me on a Wednesday just before lunch. Um, I think this is the first water Wednesday that we have all three river keepers on uh, speaking. So it's kind of, that's kind of fun and unique. Um, so uh, we're gonna talk about, let's see if I can, we're gonna talk about river access today. Um, so I'm gonna kick things off and then it's gonna go to Mark and, and then we'll finish it off with Dean and then take questions. Uh, one of the things I wanted to bring up real quick is the fact that uh, I always get asked about where to put in and where, uh, where to access the river in the upper Potomac and then likewise in the Shenandoah and, and the lower Potomac. You know, and so it's always trying to figure out uh, where these public landings are and trying to understand um, uh, what's out there, what information is out there. And so I have a little bit of a list of, of things that I'm gonna cover real quick, some online and some published resources talk a little bit about USGS water levels, um, which is very important before we get out in the river. Uh, river trail maps that we um, put together and develop uh, here for Potomac Riverkeeper Network. Talk about water reporter, uh, some of our river palooza trips here in the upper Potomac. And then something a little bit unique about river investigations. Um, you know, river access is very important to us when we're looking for pollution issues. So I'm going to cover some online resources, and you know, there's there's a little bit out there. Um, you know, a lot of your state agencies do have online virtual mapping. Uh, one of kind of more unique ones is the RiverExplorer.com. It does have a lot of information about river access, um, especially in the Upper Potomac and in the Lower Potomac, uh, where a lot of marinas are. Uh, we have um, really, but it doesn't really include a whole lot in the smaller tributaries. Uh, it does have a little bit on the Monocacy, but nothing on the Shenandoah, but it's a, it's a good place to go. You can also look at USGS gauging stations as well uh, on that site. Now, West Virginia DNR has a virtual map system as well. Uh, their focus is hunting and fishing. So you'll find out information about um, hunting and fishing requirements uh, for that state and for those areas. Um, DNR, Maryland DNR uh, has a pretty good virtual map uh, that covers all of state operated access points. And, you know, we're quite unique here in the Upper Potomac because we have the CNO Canal that runs from Cumberland all the way down to DC. So it's a very uh, unique system where you have that canal right next to the, to the river. And you can see the picture there that I have. I have a, uh, a bike and a canoe kind of hitch system. And so I do a lot of bike and canoe uh, action on the main stem of the Potomac. Two really good maps that you can order from Maryland DNR's website uh, for the upper Potomac is um, the Potomac River Water Trail and uh, for the North Branch and then for from Cumberland down to looks like uh, Shepherdstown. Um, Potomac Park. So those are really two good maps. It's like a, a whole series of uh, set of maps in those packets. Um, they're really, uh, really useful information, especially for those that want to enjoy the Sino Canal and the river itself. Some other online resources. Um, Virginia DNR does have a, a, another virtual map, again, focused on fishing. 
um, but it's also really good to uh, get information about parking spaces and other things at each of those access points. Uh, Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission has water trail maps. Unfortunately, they don't have any water trail maps in the Potomac watershed, but quite a few for the Ohio, U, and uh, Susquehanna uh, River Basin. Here's an example of the Yakagani River Water Trail North Access. So that's uh, so those are downloadable maps that you can print at your leisure and use for some of those trips. As you know, it's important for us to really be safe. And so I always want to be able to acknowledge the fact that before you go out on the river, uh, that you really should check river levels. And you have a couple of different sites to do that. And you have um, USGS gauge stations, which supplies uh, their own uh, water levels um, for several different sites and some along the main side of the Potomac and, and some of the tributaries that lead into the Potomac watershed. A few of those water uh, gauges also have water quality uh, monitoring as well as river level and discharge levels. So it's always really good to focus on understanding your river levels and what's safe and what's not safe. And the, another little tidbit fact, the um, access points, the boat ramps along the CNO Canal actually have markers on the ramp itself, painted markers, um, yellow and red, and it, it signifies um, whether the river level is safe or not for uh, your average boater. Of course, you have your whitewater fanatics that love to get out there when it's rushing down the river um, and to take part in some whitewater uh, boating. Uh, you also have NOAA. Uh, NOAA does a really good job of doing a predictive model. So for the next three or four days after the, the, you know, the time that you're looking at the river level. So that's a really good idea if you're planning a trip for the weekend coming up to really know what's going to happen based on weather events that uh, could uh, inundate the area. Uh, and the lastly, th there are some text notifications. I have some text notifications for USGS that send me messages when the river levels are um, too low or too high, and you can set the parameters for those text notifications, which I found really helpful. There are also really good couple of other publications. I know Mark's going to talk about some publications for his area. Uh, for the Upper Potomac, we have the South Branch and Potomac a Rivers Guide by Bruce Ingram. Uh, he does a fantastic job of highlighting sections in the Upper Potomac, especially the South Branch, for its fishing capacity and some of the unique features along the way. So I really recommend looking into that publication. And I use the Maryland and Delaware Canoe Trails Guide quite a bit. It's got some really unique uh, tips and information about the tributaries that lead into the Potomac River uh, that are quite useful. So it's those are um, two really good resources that I recommend every boater in the Potomac um, look at. Uh, and, you know, not to brag a little bit, but we do have a trail map uh, production with Potomac Riverkeeper Network. Uh, we have some available maps right now, one for Peckin Creek, Patterson Creek, both in West Virginia. And then a set of three maps that covers the South Branch Potomac from, oh, uh, from all the way up to the headwaters to the mouth of the South Branch. And we are in the process, almost completed actually, the Conicachee Creek water trail map. And that's from the Maryland Pennsylvania state line to the mouth. And our next maps that we're going to be working on is the Cacapin River and Antietam Creek. Now, these are really great maps. Uh, they're foldable, very similar to the DNR maps that show the CNO Canal. And we have information for all the um, official sites that are state run, but we also have a few that are county run uh, and even some that are quasi private. You know, they, there is um, ability for the public to access these rivers at some of these locations as long as you behave yourself and you respect landowners. 
Um, and so these are really good maps. Uh, they're waterproof and you can write on them. I know that I take my maps out with me and I'll write little notes along the way that signify great sections for fishing or sections to watch out for high water or, or something like that, some other features. Now these maps are free to members. And so we um, encourage everyone here that's not a member, become a member of Tome River Divot Network and you can get a series, the, the maps that are already in print and you'll be, you'll have access to all the maps that we will have printed down the road. Um, it, with respect to these water trail maps, we are looking for sponsorships um, to help pay for the printing of these maps so that we can uh, provide them for free to our members. So uh, email me if you're interested in becoming a sponsor and help to uh, pay for the printing of these, uh, these maps. And we're also gonna be doing a revamp of our website. Uh, we're looking at doing a massive upgrade. and We really wanna include some virtual mappings to where we can um, kind of be a repository for all the state uh, access points and information for each one. Um, places to go camping along the way or just in general that are close to the rivers and streams. Um, you know, we're looking at um, identifying where all the USGS gauge stations are, which would then have a link to the, uh, to the river gauges themselves. And we also want to highlight our river palooza trips and all the information that, you know, we um, include on these river trips and also um, the streams that we will have a water trail map for. So look for this upgrade here real soon. We are working on it um, aggressively and we hope to have it up uh, by, this, by the summertime, I'm hoping, but um, we'll see how that works out. I also wanna highlight the use of Water Reporter. I really encourage everyone who's out on the water uh, to download this app and sign up. It's a, Water Reporter is, is a mobile app that allows you to report pollution um, you can share beautiful rivers, and actually, lately, we've been using it for water quality data um, assessments. And this is really important because if you sign up for Potomac Riverkeeper Network as one of the organizations that you identify with in this app, we immediately get a uh, message, uh, an email message that has this pollution report that we can follow up on, or if you have a beautiful river. Uh, photo, and then we can use that photo to share in our social media. So I really encourage everyone to look at Water Reporter and share with your friends as well. River Palooza, we are on for 2021. We had to postpone in 2020 to our to wonderful COVID situation. Uh, here in the Upper Potomac, um, we're going to be doing two of the popular trips, Tour Through History on the Antietam and the trough on the South Branch Potomac. So those are two really popular trips that we're gonna be doing in June and July. And I encourage you to do an early sign up because there is space limited for these trips. And the other river keepers will also have some trips in their watersheds um, and stay tuned for the full and complete list and dates, uh, which should be coming up in another month or so. We'll get real close to paddle season. Uh, lastly, I really did want to kind of cover river access and riverkeeper investigations. You know, we are boots on the ground. We are out there patrolling our rivers and streams. And, you know, we sometimes don't always necessarily go from state approved access to state approved access. You know, a lot of times we are trying to make a, an efficient assessment of a pollution problem, and we will try and find a quick access, um, you know, that strip along the bridge that accesses to a river, or we'll knock on some doors and ask some folks if we can launch from their property, uh, whatever it takes to try and efficiently get to a pollution site so that we can investigate and take pictures. Now, this is a picture of an interesting situation. This is on the North Branch Potomac at the uh, Verso Mill in Luke, Maryland. So, so you see the path right there that has a fence around and blocking the path. That was open for like decades and decades where it was kind of a local known place that you can 
put into the North Branch Potomac or uh, portage around the dam that's there at Luke. And after our investigation of black liquor pollution coming from that site, uh, they didn't like the fact that we were investigating pollution. So they erected this fence around that access and that portage path. Um, so stay tuned for future possible petition to request that Verso remove that fence and allow freedom of portage around that dam because that dam is a hazard. And it would be really nice to be able to um, fully float that section of the river. It's an absolutely beautiful section too. So with that, I'm gonna stop sharing uh, my screen and turn it over to Mark so that he can uh, talk about the Shenandoah. Thanks, Brent. Right, um, pull this, do that. Cool. All right, Shenandoah. You know, we're really blessed out here um, with the number of access points that we, that we have on the Shenandoah. Um, and so we're really fortunate in that respect, especially on the on the South Fork. But I thought I'd talk a little bit about the just the geography of the Shenandoah River system, because oftentimes when people talk about coming out from D.C., they're going, I'm going out to the Shenandoah. Most of the time they're talking about going out to the South Fork of the Shenandoah. But there's the North Fork and the main stem as well. And so this is a good little. Um, you know, just map right there in the center, if you guys can see my cursor, that's Massanutten Mountain. And on the east side is the South Fork, and over on the west side is the North Fork of the Shenandoah. And they both come up and join at Front Royal, create the main stem, and then from Front Royal all the way up to Harper's Ferry is the Shenandoah River. And, um, it, you know, it, it empties at Harper's Ferry and there's only about maybe 15 miles of the Shenandoah is in West Virginia and everything else is in, in Virginia. Um, here you can get just a little bit um, better idea of the separate watersheds. And you can see that the, uh, the watershed for um, the South Fork of the Shenandoah is all the way down below Waynesboro um, with the South River and the Middle River and the North Rivers. And over on the left side of the screen is showing the headwaters of the of um, the North Fork of the Shenandoah up in here in, in Bath and Rockingham County. And it's kind of interesting up in this area, you have three river systems being born. You have the Shenandoah, you have parts of the Potomac going north, and then you have parts um, spilling south um, into the James River. And so it's kind of a unique geological um, area um, uh, out there. And Brent already touched upon the, the uh, Water Reporter app. The little blue diamonds that you see there, um, those are all the river gauges on the on the system. Uh, definitely worth doing it. And so, you know, they say, you know, time on water is the best teacher. And um, but sometimes you're not really certain what to do about that or where to go. And so, um, you know, another very famous professor talked about uh, reading and, um, and and he had some good insights there as well. Dr. Seuss. So I'm just going to blow through a bunch of um, publications that are definitely worth uh, picking up. Um, these are all mine. They're all dog-eared because I refer to them quite a bit. So we got Ed Grove, just a, an amazing book on classic Virginia rivers. Um, if you want to really focus on whitewater, uh, Roger Corbett's book is just great. Um, talks about a lot of the headwater streams of the Shenandoah um, in there and when you can paddle and talks about uh, river levels when they're runnable. Um, so it's definitely worth uh, picking up a copy of that. And then going back to the Potomac for a second, this is a great little book, um, The Hiker's Guide to the CNO Canal. And, you know, it talks about all the different access points. And so um, the Potomac is, is just really blessed with the, just a tremendous amount of access points because you have the canal running the entire length of it. And so there's a lot of good information uh, in this about hiker biker locations, as well as just historical information. And uh, Brent also mentioned some of the other strip maps by the Interstate Commission on the Potomac River Basin. This is another excellent one that uh, takes you from Georgetown to Opaken Creek up in the um, uh, Winchester uh, area out in Virginia, definitely worth picking up. Um, and then if you're interested in fishing, this is an older book. Uh, Ken Penrod, he uh, still guides out on the, on the river. Um, 
just a great book and, and um, talking about what you're likely to encounter on the upper portion of the Potomac uh, River. That the uh, picture is actually a painting by Mark Sassino. Uh, Mark is a famous wildlife um, artist. Um, the gentleman rowing the raft is, is Mark Kovac, a longtime fishing guide. I, I guide with Mark on the river and Mark Sassino, a little fun fact if there are any Potomac River Smallmouth Club members out there, Mark uh, was the one that um, designed and drew the original Potomac River Smallmouth Club logo. Uh, that's just an excellent picture of the smallmouth bass. Um, and then we have Bruce Ingram. Bruce is great, um, just a, a, a great book. This one's on the Shenandoah on the Potomac, talks about access points, talks about fishing, what you're likely to encounter. That particular picture is right at the mouth of the Potomac and Shenandoah. You got Harper's Ferry right there um, to the left. And um, that's the remnants of the 340 bridge uh, on the, that originally crossed the Shenandoah River. Um, Harper's Ferry for being such a small little town had a tremendous role in the creation of our, of our country. And it's right at the confluence of the Shenandoah and Potomac. Um, it talks about just everything and it's, and it's a book well worth, worth picking up. Um, and so I'm not certain what's going on. Um, and then um, the Virginia At uh, Atlas and Gazetteer, um, you know, it, it's great just taking it in the winter months and just blowing through and just, you know, finding locations and, and seeing where you need to paddle this summer. Um, and then Shenandoah River Atlas, this is like an old school, old school uh, book that you can open up. Um, it's spiral bound and there's just a wealth of information in it. And it was literally cut and pasted together. And so when you get in it, you see that little eye chart. Um, and then when you drill in and look a little bit closer, you go, oh, Blu-ray hydro power dam, 22 foot drop. Not gonna run that, portage on the left. And so there's a wealth of information in that, in that book. It actually was produced by uh, Friends of the Shenandoah River. It's still available, um, 35 bucks. They'll mail you a copy, um, well worth getting. Um, and then we have the Shenandoah uh, uh, Swim Guide um, and you know, you can go online and, and just check out and we probably have, I don't know, 60 or 70 um, access points on the, on the North Fork, South Fork, Main Stem, South River, Middle River, um, and just more information than, than I can even do. And here's another eye chart, but this is just the Burnshire Bridge right up. Um, and you can see that and it, it talks about what you're likely to encounter it. Where do you portage? Where do you go? Um, safety concerns. And so it's just a, a phenomenally good resource to access and to use. Now with, with flow trips, um, uh, you know, on the Shenandoah, th there's just a million of them really. Um, these are kind of illustrative. I start at the Southern end and work my way North. But um, when you look at them, they're all roughly anywhere from three to seven, eight, nine. There's a few that are longer. Um, but just a good all day float. Um, and, um, you know, and they, they're all good and they all have their sort of own unique characteristics. But what's, what's um, really sort of common um, about them is um, the Shenandoah is really blessed with a gentle gradient. Um, when, you, when you look at the gradient overall for, for the river, it, it averages anywhere from a half a foot to maybe 3.5 feet per mile, which is a very gentle, soft gradient. And um, you know, in, in comparison, if you go up to uh, Brent's neck of the woods and you go to the, um, the, the north branch of the Potomac at, at Barnum, you have about a 35 foot uh, uh, gradient per mile. So much deeper. So anywhere from you know, 10 to 60, 70 times um, you know, difference in, in gradient. So, it's, it's a, a, the Shenandoah is just a great place to come out and enjoy a, a trip, a fishing trip, or just a gentle uh, float trip with your friends or family and newbies and rookies that have never been on the water before. And just a couple more, that, that, that long stretch fosters the Bentonville, that's where it contains the, um, the, the biggest rapids on, this, on the South Fork, uh, uh, which is Compton Rapids, which is a 
class one, maybe in the spring, it's a solid two, dead of winter with high flow, cold temperatures, you squint your eyes, it could bump up to a three. Um, and so, and, and, and part of what makes it so good um, about access points on the South Fork of the Shenandoah, when you look at it, you see Route 340. And 340 starts, you know, all the way down Stewart's Draft area, and it literally goes all the way up and crosses the Potomac at Harper's Ferry. And so on the South Fork of the Shenandoah, you have just countless access points. Wherever a bridge crosses 340, um, that's a public right of way at that, at that um, you know, VDOT bridge. And so really fortunate in, the, in that respect. The North Fork does not have as many access points. Um, when you look at the asterisks, those are the state run and state maintained um, um, you know, access uh, points. And, but yet, you know, we still have 11 of them. Um, but, you know, we could use a little bit more, um, you know, we have the Seven Bend State Park that just opened up last year, and then the um, Headley Bridge um, is just being finalized, uh, you know, now, and so it, the, we, North Fork is getting a, a few more access points. Um, and then Main Stem, you know, from Front Royal all the way up to Harper's Ferry, um, you don't have as many access points, quite honestly. That Route 50 to Locks, that's a popular stretch, but it's 10 miles. And on the Shenandoah, if you're fishing, you should expect to um, take about an hour to go one mile. So if you're fishing 50 to Locks in the summer, you're going to have a long day. Um, and so it's important just to keep that in mind. And then up in West Virginia, you know, you have the Shenandoah um, Springs, you have Moulton Park, and then Millville uh, right there in, in Harpers Ferry. So in terms of, um, you know, the good, the bad, the ugly about access points on the, on the Shenandoah River system, there's just an abundance of information that's out there. We have a lot of good access points on the, on the South Fork and Main Stem. And then we also have wonderful outfitters to put you on the river. If you don't have a canoe, you don't have a kayak, or you need a shuttle, there's some great people um, out here in the Shenandoah uh, Valley and the Harpers Ferry area. Um, and then we've also um, gotten some additional um, NERDA funds, which is the DuPont Natural Resources Damage Assessment Funds. That's a whole other topic to talk about, but $42 million were um, given to the state as a result of mercury pollution um, at, the DuPont settle, at the DuPont site down in Waynesboro, Virginia on the South River. And, um, and as a result of that, um, we've been able to have a number of facilities upgraded. And with the outfitters out here in the, in the valley in the Harpers Ferry area, you'll notice, the careful reader will notice that they're alphabetical because we love all these outfitters equally. And um, there, there's no first among equals, I guess, uh, but just all good, solid um, people um, helping folks get out on the river. Uh, as an example, this is from the Front Royal Outdoors. Um, uh, outfitter Don Roberts shop. And if you go on his site, you just click and here's from this morning, river conditions, 2.24 at the front Royal gauge. And then, you know, they even, you know, sort of hold your hand and tell you, you know, this is the ideal level to be out on the river right now, to, you know, 1.7 to 229. Um, water temp 53.5. And so, um, you know, just a lot of just very solid uh, information, you know, on a, on a day by day basis and definitely worth frequenting. Uh, back to the uh, NERDA fund allocations, $42 million, lots of good things being done with the money. The one that we're interested in, the $2.5 million for improvements um, on the Shenandoah. And so as a result of those monies, uh, we got an access put in at Headley Bridge. There's some improvements down in Crimora Park on the South River. Alma built landing right here in Page County is getting uh, improvements. Morgan's Ford, um, a new bridge was put in and new access point was put in there as well. And then upgrades at the Seven Bend State Park where there's uh, uh, handicap and wheelchair accessibility uh, for the river and a, and a nice uh, canoe launch pad there as well. Um, and, and for the bad, you know, it's, it's not horrendous quite honestly. Um, you know, the three things that I would point out 
The North Fork, it's a little more remote um, and um, a lot more privately owned land. And so you don't have as many access points. Also, it's important to keep in uh, mind that the Shenandoah system drains 3,000 miles. The North Fork drains about 1,000 of that. And so in the summer, you can have very low water conditions on the North Fork where if you're not paying attention, you're gonna be doing a boat drag. And, um, and so there are times if you wanna fish out there, it's better just to pick a spot and wade. And then we have dams on both the North Fork on the South Fork. And then, um, you know, the, going back to the Potomac for a second, we have the CNO Canal, 184 miles of public land. That's just huge. It's just, it's, it's such a, um, a blessing to have. And on the Shenandoah, you don't have that. And most of the shoreline is privately owned. So when you pull off to the side and you pull out the picnic blanket and you're enjoying a meal, you're, you're more than likely parked on somebody's front yard. And so you just need to be respectful of that and mindful of that. And so back to dams, you know, are you feeling lucky? Um, we do have dams. We have hydroelectric power on the on the South Fork, on the North Fork. And so you need to be um, aware of those and cognizant of, of those. Um, here's the Luray Dam. Um, you know, you're not going to be running that. The Shenandoah Dam. Nope, not going to be running that. Chapman Dam over on the North Fork. Nope. You know, they're, they're just too high. Um, and so you need to be mindful of that. Um, and so these, you know, here's just a list of the, the other uh, dams on the North Fork that are unrunnable. And there are some, you know, other small dams that are out there. And I'm not going to say that they're runnable, runnable because I don't know your paddling skills. I'm not going to say go out and do something. And I have no clue of, of your safety and your strength and your power and the river conditions. I'm, I'm just telling you that these dams are definitely not runnable. Um, same way over on the South Fork in the, in, the, um, in, in the main stem, you have hydroelectric power being generated at, at all of these dams, Shenandoah, Newport, Luray, Front Royal, and Millville. Um, and so none of those are runnable. And so when, when you're doing a float, you need to be cognizant of those. Um, and yes, the Chapman Dam. And so the ugly. Um, you know, there, we have some ugly, not access points, but issues. Um, here's a picture of Harper's Ferry taken atop Maryland Heights. Just absolutely gorgeous. You have the Potomac in the foreground. You can see the uh, main stem of the Shenandoah in the background, and they come together and they meet at the point in Harper's Ferry. Just a wonderful place. There is no public access at Harper's Ferry, none. And so right down on the, on the little point here at the end, just out of the picture, there's a little beach. Um, but, um, you know, people can pull off there, but you're not going to be launching. There's no parking lot to be launched. Uh, when you look at the train track on the right, if you go up, you see the little red train station. That's the Harper's Ferry train station. That's the only parking lot there for most of Harper's Ferry. Um, and so it gets jammed pretty much every day, but especially on weekends. And so um, there really is no good parking area for people to launch boats from or, or to take out from. Um, and, and so that, that's an issue. And um, it, it's been that way for a long time. If you go up river on the Potomac to Bakerton area, you have um, the, the land that's owned by river riders, Matt Knott, and that's about three miles upstream. And, and you can launch from there and, and that's great. And across the river on the Maryland side, uh, you have access to the Maryland Heights um, trail to, to go up and there's a, maybe a handful of parking spots where you can park there, take your canoe or kayak, walk over and, and drop your boat into the needles. But in the Harpers Ferry area, there is no um, access and that's a problem and it's an issue. It's been talked about for a very long time and nothing has ever been improved upon. Um, so downstream from Harper's Ferry at the Weaverton area, um, you, you have um, discussions about um, accessing the river at, at Weaverton. And so um, you have three sets of, of rapids. Well, you have Whitehorse, then you have um, you know, Weaverton and Old Mill and Knoxville. And so um, in, in right in there, there's Keep Trist Road. And, and Keep Trist Road has, they 
it's not a formal parking lot, but it's a parking lot where people pull off and park. And then you throw your kayak on your shoulder and then you walk a couple hundred yards um, down, you know, across the railroad tracks, across the canal, and then down to the, into the river. And so back in 2019, there was a study that was done on a rail crossing study. The, the rails are owned by CSX Railroad. They're not thrilled about it. Um, and they say that they have the right of way. The National Park Service says that they do have the right of way, except for where there are crossings like this and they don't have a right of way. So there's lots of discussion, lots of fighting going on. But since 2019, there's been no real um, advances or improvements. On the left, you see a bridge crossing. And so it, it would allow you to you know, walk up here, cross the train tracks, go back down and go into the, um, you know, onto the canal and into the river. The other option is the at grade crossing that would have some enhanced safety features. Um, the, let me make certain I just get my, my figures right. The bridge um, in 2019 dollars was three and a half million dollars for that. And that's what CSX railroad wants um, because it, it doesn't impede rail traffic at all. Um, the, the at grade crossing is roughly $500,000 for that to happen. And so um, um, it, it would be great to have that, um, but it's, there's nothing in the, you know, on the calendar that this is gonna be built anytime um, soon. Um, and then it's not really directly an, an access issue, um, but as a result of COVID, as a result of, you know, the pandemic, everybody has fallen in love with access points on the Shenandoah and on the Potomac and probably every other beautiful river that's out there. And so we, we've gotten a lot of first time users and we've gotten a lot heavier use at all of our uh, access points and locations. And, um, you know, in, admittedly DWR, Department of Wildlife Resources in Virginia, they've, they've admitted that they're struggling with the amount of trash. Um, on the at, at the ramps and at the access points because, you know, they had, uh, you know, contracts with a trash service to come in once a week to pick up trash, which was perfectly um, reasonable in, in 2019 and 18. But all of a sudden, they're getting triple the amount of, of uh, traffic at the access points, and they don't have the money to be regularly picking up this trash. And so trash at the access points is a real is a real issue. Um, you know, some of the outfitters, Don Roberts, Front Royal Outdoors, Matt Knott um, at, at River Riders and, and River and Trail and um, Harpers Ferry Adventure Center, they're they're picking up trash on their their own and doing what they can on their own to sort of uh, improve the access points for all of us. But we all need to be cognizant of that and as best as we are able to, if we pack it in, pack it out. Um, and then um, th this other thing is, you know, I don't know if it falls into the ugly category or not, but last year a bill was passed um, in, in the middle of the pandemic that calls for access fees to be assigned to uh, recreational users of um, Virginia state maintained boat ramps and access points. And unless you own a Virginia fishing license or hunting license. Um, and, and then this spring, it came up of like, how is that going to be enforced? And the outfitters suddenly realized that they were going to be on the hook for this three or four dollar fee for every person they brought to the river. And, and how is that going to be handled? And, the, um, you know, on a Saturday afternoon, if mom, dad and, and three kids and a handful of Walmart tubes come down to the river, are they suddenly going to be hit with a twenty dollar fee to use the river? And so there are some, you know, environmental justice issues being raised here. And so um, this spring, as a result of, you know, the work that, that, that we did, that James River Association, Chesapeake Bay Foundation, Virginia Professional Paddle Sports Association, uh, we were able to get this um, legislation put in where we got a pause. And the, the legislation is still there. It's simply not going to be enforced prior to the 1st of July of 2022. And in the meantime, we're standing up a, a working group to hammer out all these issues, because believe me, there's just a whole host of um, issues as to what's going to go on there. Um, and then the other issue with with ugly that I would throw in there um, 
on this map, it's another eye chart, but essentially this is fish consumption advisory. And so in the south end of this, we have Waynesboro. And so from really below Waynesboro, um, all the way up into West Virginia, you have fish consumption advisory. And that's due to mercury levels as a result of sort of a sustained mercury spill at a DuPont plant that stopped using mercury in 1950. And so here we are 71 years later, and we're still dealing with mercury issues on the river. Um, the red is nobody should eat anything except stock trout out of that stretch from Waynesboro up to the grottoes. The yellow, um, you know, you can eat a couple of meals a month for, you know, um, and you should be safe. Um, but unless you're pregnant or you want to be pregnant or you got little kids or whatever else. And so you have that going on. And then once you hit Front Royal, you get the two for one special where you have mercury and PCBs as a result of the AFTEC plant um, affecting the, the fish. And so, um, you know, that definitely is in the ugly category. So the other things to keep in mind, um, you know, with respect to the, the river and going out on the river and, and using our access points, um, safety knowledge and etiquette. Um, one is you wanna file a float plan, let people know where you're going, you know, how long are you gonna be gone? Bring a first aid kit. Um, you know, some of the stretches of water that we're floating, um, you know, you don't have ready access to, to shore or to, you know, any kind of first aid. So you shouldn't be looking for others. You should be prepared for that yourself. The other thing, especially this time of year, you want to dress for the water, not the air. Okay. Um, if you take a spill, you stumble getting in or out of your kayak, even on the, on the shoreline, at, right at the boat ramp, it, it's going to be cold. You're going to get cold. So you want to be prepared for the water. Um, also, this time of year, especially, don't wear cotton. Cotton just sucks the life right out of you. Um, you, you as best you can and you're able to, um, you know, wear synthetics, wear fleece, um, so you can wring it out and you can move on um, with, with the day. Um, and then also, make a habit of using a log book. Like, you go out and you have an amazing day on the river and you catch a bunch of fish and the flow was perfect and you weren't scraping and you want to do that again. Well, how do you know the river's the same level? Well, you go to the Lou Ray gauge, you go to the Front Royal gauge, you, you, you go to the Harper's Ferry gauge, the Millville gauge, wherever, whatever gauge is closest to you and you record it, you write it down, 3.2. And then you wanna take a look at the gauge just upstream to see is that rising or falling. And, and by doing that, you can do a quick look, you know, after a little while and go, oh, the river's in great shape or uh, the river's blown. No sense even, you know, trying to get a hall pass to go fishing this weekend because it doesn't matter because it's just all going to be muddy. Um, and then the other thing, too, is just to keep in mind that the river is bounded um, in, on the Shenandoah for large parts by private property. You have George Washington National Forest in some areas, and that's great. And then you have Andy Guest State Park, um, and that's great. But you know, other than those two areas, large stretches of, of the river um, is, is bounded by private property on both sides. So you just need to be respectful of that. Um, you know, if you're standing on a sandbar and you're enjoying a lunch or whatever else, that's fine. But um, you know, just don't view someone's yard or someone's field as is you know a public playground it's not and um it's just important to keep that in mind and so in terms of a you know a um uh, you know just filing a log plan you know what can it be it can be something as simple as just sticking on your refrigerator door letting you know your your folks your family know where you are and when you're going to be back and um you know my son he never misses a meal and sometimes it has an extra meal thrown in. And so if he misses a meal and he's supposed to be back, I'm gonna start worrying. I'm gonna wonder what's, what's going on there. And so, but it's important just to file a float plan. Um, and it could be, if it's a two or three day camping trip, it needs to be more elaborate. I'm gonna be here and here. I'm gonna be there and there. This is what's gonna go on. And then that way, at least people have an idea as where they wanna start looking. And then finally, um, you know, if people were out there on, on this call and you're not members, we would love to have you as being members. Uh, it's important that we um, have members to, um, for legal standing, that we have our members concerned about pollution going on in, in the river. We also do any number of flow trips, as, as Brent's already talked about with river pollution and everything else. So 
we would love to have you out and um, enjoy the Shenandoah. And so now I'm going to just going to turn it over to uh, Dean. Thanks, Mark. Yeah, Dean, if you kind of just want to hit the highlights, so we have a few minutes left over for questions too. That'd be great. Hey, everybody. Um, Dean Nax, Potomac River Keeper here. Um, uh, my this is my email. If you need to get a hold of me, um, go to the next slide. Good. Um, you know, as Brent talked about, a lot of the work we do um, is pollution and finding pollution sources, eliminating pollution sources. We do our own investigations. Um, this is our mission statement, but um, I think it is important that we do work to protect the public's right to enjoyment of these water resources. Um, Mark touched on that a little bit. Um, just uh, real briefly, an issue that we have here, and if you're not familiar with the term public trust doctrine, it's important for the public to understand because it directly relates to public access. And basically that, you know, the waters, the rivers, the tides, the oceans belong to the people and up to the high water mark. And um, there's a case right here in DC where the army at Fort McNair is trying to take a 300 foot stretch of the Washington Channel, which is a very narrow channel and um, keep restrict public access to it. Um, and there was a lot of public concern about it and pushback, and they started trying to make conditions on it. But the bottom line is, what we've been trying to do as an organization is work with uh, Congresswoman Norton um, and DC City Council to educate them that, that not only does this belong to the public, and the public has the right to use and enjoy the stretch of water, but it's up to them, DC government, to protect and defend the public's right to use this waterway. And there's a lot of cases out there where, you know, like developers will try to block off a public beach that's been used for decades. Um, and it's always the, the role of the government to kind of intervene and get involved in, and defend that public trust, the public right of ownership for those public trust waterways or assets. And so just keep that in mind. I think it's really important because a lot of times groups like ours are the ones pushing government to stand up for the public right and the public trust. And that's a big part of what we do as well. Um, next slide. So um, when I first started here about six years ago, um, I was still learning the river um, and I had the opportunity to paddle down the entire Potomac River um, from Cumberland all the way down to the Chesapeake Bay, about 300 miles roughly. Um, and so, you know, through that process, I learned a lot about where to camp and, you know, just good access points. And uh, so I'm just gonna talk about that a little bit, but it was just an amazing trip. This is Brent and his daughter who joined me on the first week of the paddle. And um, if you go to the next slide, um, some of my favorite stretches here, and this again, this is up in Brent's area, is uh, this pawpaw tunnel. We actually paddled through the tunnel. Um, these are some cool pictures that I took. Um, and I was just going back through these slides the other night. Just uh, an amazing area, basically from Pawpaw Tunnel down through the Pawpaw Bends down to 15 Mile Creek. There's a, a layover camp. There's a nice two day paddle in there. You can actually turn it into a three day paddle, but, and it's, it's very wilderness. This is one of, I think, a beautiful stretch of river. If you've never been on it, just a great spot. Uh, go to the next slide if you could. Yeah. And this, this next slide is like one of the areas in that stretch, um, just a great picture I took while I was on the water. Um, so this is just a beautiful stretch up in Brent's neck of the woods. Again, my jurisdiction goes from Harper's Ferry down. If you can go to the next slide, please. Um, but yeah, but basically, you know, um, some of the things that uh, Mark had mentioned the CNO Canal, and I think it's really important to mention that from Cumberland all the way down to Georgetown um, is the CNO Canal on River Left and on the Maryland side, and it it's uh it not only has a lot of camping and public access and uh, restrooms and facilities and boat launches, but you can basically camp along any stretch of that. There's primitive camping that's allowed. They try to discourage you from camping in certain areas, but like a public boat ramp area, but. Um, this is a little picture. Uh, we paddled up the Monocacy River and basically camped uh, almost directly under the, uh, the uh, water duct, um, the aqueduct. And um, down below that stretch, um, just right here near DC, 
16 miles up from DC is Swain's Lock. There's actually camping there. You can paddle in and uh, do some camping. There's not a lot of paddle in campsites, but there is a lot of camping along the river. And again, you can do primitive camping if you're doing a through paddle. Um, Pennyfield Lock, this stretch uh, right below Seneca Breaks is one of my favorite stretches closer to home here. Uh, there's all these islands right below Dam 2. You can camp on some of these islands. Uh, some of them are privately owned. You should definitely check with that. But um, then there is the opportunity to camp, and then you can actually paddle back up to CNO Canal. You can actually do like a loop paddle. And I don't think a lot of people know that um, other than some of the locals, but that's a great opportunity. And again, all this, just feel free to reach out to us. We can help give you some ideas. Um, you know, uh, Emily had mentioned that there was interest in some of the tidal portions of the lower Potomac. And so uh, I will say that was one of the rougher stretches when I did that. Um, I think it's important to understand that from DC up all the way to Harper's Ferry, there's, there's a lot of outfitters and also up in the uh, Shenandoah, but there's really limited outfitters once you get below DC. And so just be mindful of that. And almost all of them just do loop paddles. They don't really offer um, shuttling for the most part. So you, you're pretty much on your own um, if you're gonna do a trip like this, like a multi-day paddle trip. Um, a lot of the camping is, is really limited, you know, literally 15, 20 mile stretches, which is a lot um, on a tidal, like if you're fighting the tide incoming and it's a windy day, you know, the river starts getting a couple miles wide. So um, it can definitely be challenging. Um, <clears throat> I think one of the best stretches is from Mallows Bay, the Ghost Fleet of the Potomac, where we actually run uh, paddle trips um, down to Port Tobacco. Chapel Point, there's camping there. Um, there's, there's like a 20 mile stretch on the Maryland side that's pretty much unprotected, uh, undeveloped, almost wilderness type paddling. Um, and there's, there's sections that are uh, protected public act, you know, where you can actually just pull off and do some remote primitive camping along that stretch. That's one of my more favorite stretches. Um, once you get down below Port Tobacco, especially below the 301 bridge, the river really opens up to about five miles wide. Um, and so I would just, you know, really caution anybody who's really considering doing anything down in that stretch. It's just, it's really wide, big water, you can get big waves, lots of wind, and it can make for a rough day. And if you don't know where you're pulling off, um, you could have a lot of troubles down there. So that's just, you know, and again, I'm happy to provide any feedback, but uh, you know, they are working, um, Virginia, there's some great, like, you know, new paddle sites, paddle in sites like Calendon Park, which has been there for a while. Um, so they're, they're trying to create more public access opportunities, but it is a little sporadic once you get down below that 301 bridge. Um, you can go to the next slide, Brent. Um, but basically, you know, uh, this is just another beautiful stretch. Um, if you can go to the next slide, too. Um, the thing that I think is just absolutely amazing when you're in, if you live in DC or the DC area, if you go 60 miles up river, you got Harper's Ferry, the Appalachian Trail, class three whitewater, um, just amazing, rocky, you know, mountainous. If you go 60 miles down river, you end up more with like this, like crab pots. Um, there's amazing, you find shark's teeth all along those stretches that I was talking about. Um, basically all the way from Woman Creek all the way down river. Um, you can find shark's teeth in the Bankman. Um, just a really just amazing stretch of river. And I just love the diversity of the river itself and what it has to offer um, in terms of just such a short distance and just how beautiful it is. So anyway, I, I'm going to leave it there. Um, just go to the last slide discussion and then we oh. um, are taking some questions. But thank you, everybody. And again, I echo, um, if you're not a member, we'd love for you to be a member. We do a lot for this river. Um, all three river keepers are working every day to protect it. And we have a whole team to support our work and the stuff that we're doing. So I do appreciate everybody. And we've got a lot of people on here that are already big supporters and volunteers. So thank you for that.
All right, thanks for joining us, everyone. We'll get through a few questions here. Um, I know we only have a few minutes left, so if we don't get your question, feel free to email me or our river keepers. I'll send out an email by the end of the week with the recording um, and our contact info as well, too. Uh, and don't become, don't forget to become a member as well, too. You know, um, this is a lot of great information that the guys are willing to share with everyone. Um, but of course, you know, like everyone. Um, we rely on, you know, you guys, you members to keep our organization going. So, yeah. All right, so let's start with the first question. Um, is I, so is there a new access point of, of the Potomac below Harbors Ferry in the works? See, that might be the best. Mark, you want to talk about that? <laughs> um, no, I, I, I mean, that was the Weaverton study that was done that everybody was hanging their hat on for high hopes. Um, but that is just really stalled. So there's none that I'm aware of. So uh, this is partially answered, but if anyone else wants to chime in, so what does it mean or involve to put in an access point dock, incline, bathroom? Um, you know, Dean answered a lot, obviously, but if you guys have any other insights. Well, I, I know for, um, I've worked with West Virginia DNR in trying to get uh, new access points on various different tributaries and it, it's a lot of work because you have private landowners and uh, you have to you know the state has to somehow get that access that land under state jurisdiction and sometimes you have to work with the landowners to do that and then it's just a matter of uh, construction and putting things in but with bathrooms and that kind of thing yeah that's you know uh, the states are really not wanting to do a whole lot of maintenance for these sites. They just don't have the, the staffing or the funds to do so. Um, and so a lot of times what you get is just a ramp and an access point in the parking lot. Yeah, and then you got to maintain it too, which is always yeah. you know, challenging for the state. Yep. More, more money. So Sharon wants to know, is there a chance, is there by chance an online list with links to purchasing the various maps? So um, the ones that Brent did, uh, if we're talking about those, um, all you need to do is become a member, which is easy to do on our website. Um, and then you can go ahead and send him an email. I'm not sure about the other one, if there's any other ones. Um, well, I know that we can probably provide some links to the books um, to where maybe if they're available at Amazon. Um, a lot of time in the other printed maps are going to be at your state DNR websites. So next question, I can't remember what point we were talking about this, but are those PCB and mercury point sources still leaching? What's the half life of these contaminating events? I think uh, that was during, yeah, yeah on, on the mercury on the South Fork of the, of the Shenandoah, um, there's been a, a large effort to try to contain and control that mercury. Um, they've done a, a lot of, in addition to the $42 million they spent on trying to make the river whole again, uh, there's a whole other uh, fee being assessed to them to try to extract the mercury. Real short, the mercury gets pushed to the shoreline. It sits there, it's embedded in the soil, embedded in the dearth. A heavy flood comes along, a high water event comes along, it washes that like a washing machine, agitates the soil, and reintroduces that mercury back into the uh, into the river. So it's still there; it's still present. Um, uh, the PCBs um, are still there. Um, you know that was a super fun site. Still is a super sun site. They literally, you know, excavated. I don't know how many millions of tons of. Uh, of soil to try to remove that from the from the area in Front Royal, but there are still PCBs that are in the in the river system. Um, so Jan asked about Forever Chemicals and Antietam. Um, since we're talking about river access right now, I would suggest you check out our website. Um, we did a whole other presentation on um, PFAS, so that should be on there. Um, so Margaret asked about handicap access. Are there handicap access points? Kind of. Um, on the river. Yeah, Emily, I, I just posted the uh, the Virginia DWR site that shows all of their accessible sites for fishing platforms and um, uh, canoe friendly um, 
access points. Uh, yeah, uh, great. And then is there a portal where citizens can submit possible contaminants? Um, so water reporter, if Mark, you want to talk about that for a second. Yeah, I mean, water reporter is the is a is a great way to if you see something, you just take a photo, write up a blurb, send it. It will go to the river keepers area of responsibility, and uh, we can act on it. The other way is if you see agricultural issues, um, we submit agricultural steward stewardship act complaints, and individuals can do that as well. Sometimes I think they're probably more effective coming from a citizen as opposed to just the Shenandoah Riverkeeper constantly hitting VDACs upside the head with, with complaints every week. Um, but you can, you can go that route as well. Uh, so let's see. So I think some of the outfitters will provide river access in Harper's Ferry, but any idea which ones and what they charge? Uh, river riders, um, uh, provide, well, actually River Riders, Harper's Ferry Adventure Center, and um, uh, River and Trail all put people on both the the Shenandoah and on the um, and on, well yeah and on the Potomac all, all three okay. of those uh, do mm -hmm. um, they charge a shuttle fee what that is I I you know I, I don't know if you go on on their any of their web pages I'm sure you can find it out um, uh, pretty quickly. Yeah, River and Trail also um, does a lot of work in the Antietam. And so there's a lot. I mean, that's probably one of the most popular streams in the Upper Potomac uh, for, for recreation. They also provide uh, or allow uh, rafting trips up on the North Branch when you have Jennings Randolph Dam uh, releasing water, which they do a couple of times in the spring and a couple of times in the fall. So those are very specific trips that river and trail will, will provide so look look for those it's a lot of fun all right uh so in the interest of time since we are over i think we're gonna end it there um like i said please become a member um we talked a little bit about our river palooza trips we got a bunch coming up uh this summer um so keep your eyes out for that we'll send it out over our e-news um so even more reason to become a member uh <laughs> or we'll post on social media as well too. Um, like I said, feel free to email us with any questions um, and I will send out the recording in a couple days. So thank you. Thanks everyone for joining us. Unless thank you all. Thanks any, everyone. Uh, Appreciate it. Bye guys. Bye.